Greetings, Summoners. Cosmic here, and welcome back to another Battle Spirit Saga video. And today we have something a little extra spicy. And I know everyone's all focused on top one, top two, top three, what have you, but there's a super spicy list that you might have missed out on. And today I get to be joined by the pilot. And a couple of different people played this deck. It was kind of out there in the field. It was really funny on the Vegas floor. You heard people talking about it. But today I am joined by Brendan Remont, who made top 32 in Vegas with this super aggressive. Very nice to see mono white aggro deck. So, Brandon, go ahead and introduce yourself and give us a little bit of background of, you know, what other card game background do you come from? Sure. My name's Brandon. Um, I played uh, just a whole ton of different card games uh, over the course of my life, mostly uh, Magic, but uh, primarily for competitive purposes, Force of Will. Uh, that's where I know you from, Cos. And uh, I many gps for that one went to worlds three times going to be going to worlds again here hopefully in about three months uh for the fourth time for that um i've also played a lot of competitive hearthstone in runeterra uh and i uh, was really excited to pick up uh, battle spirits because uh, i just knew so many people that were uh, that were playing battle spirit saga i should say um because i knew a lot of people that were uh, playing it and uh and got to see in vegas so what was the first time that you heard about the game? I know there's a lot of us from the Force of Will side that have, obviously, well, because of me, you know, I'm sure I'm at fault by this, subject, that. but there's a lot of other people too in the Force of Will community that have been talking about it and, and really, you know, saying, hey, there's this game coming out. Yes, cash pricing is nice. Good and bad well, things, obviously, about gameplay, but what was really the first time that you heard about it and made you want to, you know, look into it more? Well, you hit the nail on the head. It was actually your Twitter. Uh, I saw you uh, <laughs> you post something about Battle Spirits, and I was like, oh, it's just another Japanese anime card game coming to the United States. Uh, and, and then you posted something about the prize pool, and I was like, now hold the phone. That sounds uh, sounds interesting. So, um, And then uh, I just like, kind of ignored that, and then you kept posting about it on Twitter. And then eventually other people I knew started talking about it, linking to your Twitter. And, uh, and eventually we had a little group formed that was like, maybe we should, uh, should, should, should try and be competitive in Battle Spirits. So um, I ended up kind of getting roped into that. Uh, I wasn't as serious about it as, as several other Force Will players uh, were for a little bit, but eventually I kind of uh, hyped up my expectations for it and, and buckled down and, uh, and ended up doing pretty okay in Vegas. So happy with how that turned out. Yeah, definitely any time that you can walk away with cash, especially with something that, you know, a little bit of testing went into it, maybe not as much as you would normally do for Forest Will or other games, just kind of when you came into it. But there was a couple different decks that we were all playing and whatnot, and I unfortunately died to this deck uh, turn one, or I've seen it kill on turn one, which is insane. Oh, yeah. But I got to ask, you know, without giving away too much, getting into it too much, what made you land on this version of white and what other decks were like kind of considering and what ultimately made you, you know, fall back on this just turn stuff sideways strategy? Well, as, as it often goes... Uh, you end up playing what you what you got beat with, and so um, I I originally started on Nova combo for the longest time. We then ended up moving into Bishop Nova, and for up until about I want to say five days before Vegas, we were convinced that Bishop Nova wasn't losing to anything consistently. That it was the best deck in the format, and that we uh, we we'd cracked it. Right, that's what we were playing. And then about five days before Vegas happened. Um, we were introduced to this mono white aggro deck and it was just thrashing us three ways to Sunday. I mean, it was just beating everything that we had. We were, we had 10 card sideboards put together for the aggro and it just wasn't good enough. And it just felt like this deck was, even if you were prepared for it, uh, consistently winning game ones and then still holding pretty well into game twos. And that was knowing what you were playing against, like in, in testing a lot of the time, you know, you say like, "Hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna play my, my yellow deck here, and and you're gonna play your Fanatec Elk deck, whatever." And and the aggro deck falls off a lot in value when you know that you're playing against the aggro deck. And it was still winning, and so we kind of like went through this mental equation that was like, if this deck is just intrinsically good, and it gains a horrendously disgusting amount of equity in the Swiss when you sit down against people that don't know they're about to get white aggroed. Um, Surely this deck is just always going to have to top, right? And and that's kind of what we kind of what we thought, and um, and and that kind of ended up reflecting how the Swiss and I ended up going undefeated in the Swiss, which was nice. 
um, because in, in large part because people would just play a nexus on one against me, or they <laughs> you know keep their hand of six drops against me, thinking like okay, well you know whatever happens here, I'll I'll get a turn to play this stuff, and then they, then they don't. Um, and then of course when, once it's open deck list and you know what's going on, the deck um, loses a little bit of power, but I, but I hold its own pretty well. Yeah, I'm definitely uh, have fallen prey to that. You know what? Oh, this is fine. How how explosive can this deck really be? And I'd go Nexus Pass, and then I'm like, oh no, I I'm just dead here, ain't it? Or you know, you go down to one, and then you're just dead the next turn. Like there's not enough right. that you can really do to get back from that board state because you know we always make we made the joke in the group chat and some other players like, yeah, cool. Absolute Ice Shield is a card. Yes, it'll save you a turn, but there's still five dudes on board that you have to deal with, or you're still going to die on the following turn. It, it definitely creates some very interesting board states. Right. And with that note, you know, went undefeated uh, in Swiss that you'd mentioned, got to top 32. The open deck list did hurt a little bit, but, you know, what, just a quick overview, what did you play in the Swiss rounds? And was there one, you know, matchup in particular that, you know, once you got to game two and game three, that really gave you, you know, a little bit of a struggle, right? What color really felt like you had to work a little sure. bit more for it? We ended up playing seven rounds of Swiss. Of those rounds, two of them were against white decks and five of them were against practically mono red decks um the the true duelist list basically um the white decks had it felt like almost no win chances um the deck that ended up winning the whole thing was white but it was very different than the ones i played against it was it was a very anti-aggro tech deck but the like fanatech elk decks that i played against it it's you just don't give them enough time like they basically need to play that nexus that reduces machine beast costs. They want to throw down their elephants. They want to throw down their um, uh, enterprise, and it just don't give them any time to do any of that. Those matchups felt very good. Um, the red decks, I do believe, are can be favored, especially like the pterosaur leaning versions or the the red deck wins as they were talking about that play like the horn grizzlies and the. Um, Sometimes firefish out of the sideboard, that kind of thing. Those can hold their own, uh, but you you really need to have a very good draw with the red deck, and you need the white deck to stumble, and you need to know what you're playing against. So, um, ended up getting through all that really nicely. I don't believe I had any particularly hard matchups. Two of the red decks took me to game three on the back of of just curving out big creatures, and and I certainly could have lost to them in another world, but in this event didn't yeah just absolutely cruise through uh swiss all things considered so mm -hmm. going into the deck list itself i know the big thing a lot of people are going to just like you know eyes popping out of their heads sort of thing there are zero copies of absolute ice shield in the main deck and you know definitely want to know your thoughts on that a little bit and then also would you change anything in the list right i know we want to be these more aggressive strategies but would you put a couple in main just leave them for the sideboard definitely talk about the uh know your thoughts on the deck overall yeah um i definitely would not add them to the main so one of the uh the interesting things about this game is that uh, creatures combo with creatures. And that's kind of like a... I know this might sound like kind of a weird thing to say, but it's really true because, um, as we were kind of talking about earlier, uh, small creatures reduce the cost of other small creatures just the same as big creatures do. And so... Or um, spirits, rather, in this game. And, uh, and so having a deck that has a very high density of small creatures is better than a deck with a very medium uh, density of small creatures or a small density of, of those because you more consistently can get your creatures for free additionally when you're playing against more tempo oriented decks um you can generally assume that at least for the early swinging phases your creatures are usually going to be smaller than the random four and five drops that your opponents are deploying against you and so because of that, a lot of the time, your attacks are going to start with an attack that does nothing, that is just going to tap a blocker, basically, and then get the guys in. Because of this relationship, it is extremely detrimental for this deck to draw a, a spirit or a card that it cannot play in the first couple of turns. 
When you draw an absolute ice block with other decks, it's generally fine to good because that absolute ice block is going to guarantee you another turn anyway. So it's going to essentially replace itself. In this deck, that's not necessarily true. You, it's, it's important to not draw absolute ice shield because that de delays the potential deploying of Valkyrie Mist because you need to hit that critical three, uh, three reduction for Valkyrie Mist to cost one. And... Um, doesn't really contribute to your game plan because when you draw it, other decks uh, can guarantee that it, that Absolute Ice Shield is going to be an additional turn, which is typically going to be uh, pretty good for you. But going one additional turn uh, in this deck is generally going to be bad because you're probably going to be falling behind the more and more mana people have access to. And even worse than that, it doesn't help you deploy your other creatures. And so, and it doesn't uh, attack after way and attacked to get rid of a blocker and so absolute ice shield really is is a disaster to draw in this deck if it is in your main board i mean it really can uh in, in at least those three describable ways uh make your winning chances considerably worse um additionally and this is kind of a of a side point is that because your opponents are so constantly on the back foot and so constantly needing to block it's very difficult for them to put together they're an attack that would kill you even despite Absolute Ice Shield. And if they are, you're almost certainly losing that game anyway, even despite Absolute Ice Shield. So there, there's really almost no circumstance in which you want it, unless you're going against exactly the mirror in which you're both basically just running past each other, ships in the night basically, um, trying to get to each other's faces first, in which case Ice Shield uh, uh, does actually buy you an appropriate amount of time to turn things back sideways, which is why it's in the sideboard. But uh, against ex anything other than the exact mirror, you probably don't bring it in. And that was a good uh, leading into the next question. I was going to say, you know, hey, what what do you bring it in? So you you'd find yourself not wanting to bring it in even against other, you know, like hyper low to the ground red aggro, because I think we're going to be seeing a lot more of that post Vegas, thanks to the, the guys over at True Duelist and just some of the other lists we've seen you know, around launch, is there other cards you'd feel would help better in those matchups, or does it just have to alter how you play it out? Yeah, uh, believe it or not, we are actually pretty considerably faster than than that deck. I, I actually do believe that the mono white, and, and after mono white was introduced, we tested these mono red, these mono yellow um, perversions of the deck, and, uh, and to see, like, oh, is, is is there for just turning them sideways? Uh, I actually do believe that because of Valkyrie Mist and because of um, Regain, White is actually doing it faster. And, and you, and you kind of see this as the red matchup plays out, that the red deck kind of needs to audible to the back foot plan of being more defensive, of going taller. Um, and so I, I don't even bring it in against the red aggro deck. It really is really and truly is just the white mirror that I think it that it, it adds usefulness. Um, and we kind of expected the mono white deck to be more popular than it ended up being, which is why I have three sideboard slots for it. If I could do Vegas again, knowing the numbers of turnouts, I don't even think I'd have ice block in the sideboard. I I, I never brought it in. I, I literally did not <laughs> bring it in for one single round. So really a great budget option then. I mean, if you take out the absolute ice shields and maybe the enterprise as well, that might end up seeing some type of value, you know, post launch and, and depending on how some of these lists go. But I mean, the rest of this, and I guess there's a Derm Dyna too, but generally speaking, it's all commons, uncommons, and, you know, the cheaper rares too, even. So this is going to be a great option for people to pick up. So oh. in your opinion, would this be the go-to aggro deck that you expect to see as the format kind of continues to evolve from here? Or was it kind of like a flash in the pan and just had a, when everyone was doing these very greedy decks, right? I know we talked about this a lot. There's a lot of greedy decks and a lot of people got punished in Vegas because of it. So a low to the ground aggro deck like this could be, you know, kind of the thing to pick as we look forward to the store release events. Yeah, absolutely. I think that what's funny is even all of the, the non-budget cards you said, Durham, Dyna, and Enterprise, those are like the 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 like forty ninth and fiftieth cards that you need to add <laughs> to this deck. Like they're they're really the enterprise in the sideboard is very specifically for these like purple core drain decks that play like Mortred and um, Belthagor and are like trying really hard to like compete on on this low to the ground uh, level with the white decks. And 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 we did find that those do have a leg sometimes against the white decks. And so and so that's what that's in core. 
Dinah uh, sideboards out almost every time. It really is just a sneaky way to like get the last couple points of damage in against a deck that accidentally plays a Nexus on one. <laughs> but if your opponent really knows what they're doing and isn't yellow, then they usually just side their Nexuses out and don't get to play them against us anymore. And so like Derm Dinah then typically comes out as well. And so really, you could very realistically play this deck with zero X zero ice blocks and i don't even think it would be that much worse i mean it, it would honestly even be just fine yeah you know you might miss those in a couple of matchups but as you said there's gonna be some scenarios where it's just getting sideboarded out anyways like sure. let it be something else in that regard um, yeah Dur 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 my number one sideboarded out card like, <laughs> man he has not such even. a nice spr though too i love the artwork really though it's a beautiful card it's and it's so fun when it goes off, but <laughs> he'll um, have his day. It's just uh, not today, unfortunately, or maybe not anytime not soon. In this deck. He, he was in the deck that won the whole thing. So he true, true, true. Here, but... Yeah, I was playing two in my version of the Elephant Control, and I, I have to still go over the, the Vegas winning list. I've just been busy with all the other news updates, but I think it's just a solid card that we're going to expect to see oh, just sure. in the slower decks because unblockable at the end of the day, it's sometimes you just need that one bit of chip damage and it'll go the distance for you. And, and it's been, yeah. yeah, he's one of the few, well, there's only that in a uh, Phantom King Lin, I think is the only other card in set one that have truly unblockable text on them. Yeah, no, I, I think it's a, an amazing card for breaking uh white pillow forts for sure in, in that, in that matchup. And, um, yeah, I think Durndine is a very good card. I just think that it is sort of not at home in this deck. Sometimes it's good, but uh, you definitely don't have to play it if you want to be budget. Yep, definitely, again, a good pick for a lot of people coming into the store release events because, hey, sometimes just turn things sideways and even better, right? Enjoy your 10-minute rounds. You get a lot of time to stretch, grab some water, <laughs> grab a snack. It's perfect. Oh, it's a, it's, it's a blessing and a curse at the same time. Like, it's so nice to be able to have those 50 minutes to relax between each round and wait for everyone to be done and just being so bored for most of the tournament is incredible. <laughs> so with that, you know, great overview of the deck overall. And I know that we only had a chance to, within our, you know, playtest group as a world word, were dabble into other colors. But what is your favorite card in this that you would say? Again, it could be from this deck in particular, or just overall your favorite card from both the uh, Dawn of History and the starter decks. Uh from from this deck, it's certainly Valkyrie Myths. The card is just disgusting. It is unbelievable that this card costs one after the three reduction symbols, and that it just takes out a blocker and puts on another body. So like most other most of the time the deck is just kind of like addition equations, right? Like it's like I have four guys, you have two guys, that's two damage. I lose two guys next turn. We're we're gonna do that again until Valkyrie Mist is is essentially a plus two, right? Because it sets the body on the field that does damage and, and gets rid of a thing. It gets rid of the dragon arcs, which are sometimes a little annoying. Gets rid of the fire fishes, which are sometimes annoying. I mean, it's just the cleanest answer to everything that costs seven or less and gets in for damage just the same. The card's disgusting. It's definitely like my favorite in terms of the best card in, in, in that deck. Um, if I wanted to say my favorite card in terms of like what I actually enjoy, I'm going to say Dark Bishop Basculus, I believe is his name. Yep. The Dark um, Bishop, remove all the cores. Right, remove all but one core from everything. I think it causes a lot of very interesting gameplay decisions. I think that it's a very depthful card, uh, and it's very unassuming. Like, you kind of read it, and you're like, oh, I get it. You're, you're supposed to put them all to one for the sake of all of Black's, like, four type effects. And, uh, and then that's the synergy. And that is true. But the fact that he can just, like, randomly break Enterprise barriers on other things and then, and, and, like, put things to the size as necessary for Nova to kill and uh, make things small enough for Volcanic Break, and he just, like, has an awful lot of gameplay to him, is very gameplay-rich, and, and I enjoy that in the card. So that's probably my, my actual favorite card. Yeah, the flexibility that allows uh, both within purple itself, but then just opening up to other removal options you mentioned. He's really a card that I'm expecting. Get your foils early, right? Uh, I definitely think it's a card we're going to be seeing a lot more of uh, beyond set one, going into EXO one, BSSO two, and things of that nature. It's definitely going to be uh, sticking around for a bit. But also right. on the other side of that coin, what is your least favorite card in the set? Be it from a balance standpoint, mm -hmm. hate running into it, things of that nature. So I don't, I don't want to like hate too much on my deck because it like took me pretty far but i think that 
my least favorite card is like a collection of cards, which is basically all of these cards that cost one and have one reduction symbol on their on their card. Um, we call them the zero mana cards. Uh, because I believe that they do not create the most fun gameplay experience. And like again, I, I know that I, I'm I'm being a hypocrite here because I, I took this deck to top 32, but I do not believe that this deck is either the most fun to play or and certainly not the most fun to play against. I'm I'm not gonna be over here saying that my opponents had the best time of their lives playing against this, right? Like there's very few decision making moments. There's very little skill expression. Obviously, the games are over extraordinarily fast, which you know, isn't, isn't always a good thing, especially when you have to do it a lot of times. And um, I sort of wish that there were fewer of them. It is kind of crazy to me just the sheer number that there of these that there managed to be in set one, and it makes me kind of nervous for the number that there's going to be uh, in the future. Like it's, it's it's it seems unlikely to me release set one and then after that be like oh, our philosophy has changed we are now no longer going to print vanilla zero drops anymore because they're 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 aggressively um they create situations that are unfun and um this gameplay strategy of just pick all the zero mana cards don't even read their text don't even read their their battle points throw them all in one deck dump as much as your hand and turn and turn it sideways i think is, is is for the most part not good for the game and ice shield helps it doesn't help enough but it helps and and hopefully we get more effects that, that continue to help that more and, and of course that they can choose if they want to to print effects that make it um make it so that this sort of thing is not as popular and i hope that they do uh, but for now in general all of them are, are mostly my least favorite yeah, I love this too, right? Because it gets us pointed in two directions. So one, Absolute Ice Shield is definitely a card that's come under a lot of fire lately saying, oh, this is terrible for the game. It's the worst thing ever. It's just full RNG fiesta of who draws it, who doesn't, which definitely is true in, in some cases. Don't get me wrong. But now we're starting to see like, oh, this is the ugly side of it. And again, an Absolute Ice Shield isn't going to save you by itself, but it might buy you that turn or two you need to be able to come back from a more aggressive strategy like this. So it'll definitely be interesting to see how this one pans out with the meta overall and where a lot of people will then fall on it for Absolute Ice Shield. And the other part of this, too, for just a quick history lesson, right, for those that are listening in on this or watching or don't know, um, back in Battle Spirit, so, of course, a Japanese version of the game, they had printed zero-cost spirits, so you could just vomit your hand, put a core on them, and swing. And it's a little scary that in the EX01 product, you know, just a distributor memo, as it were, says that there is going to be quote unquote, early free cost spirits that you can play. So those could be zero cost spirits again. And we might find even a more aggressive strategy coming online for some of these decks. Now, again, when that happened in uh, the Battle Spirits in Japan version, they did ban it. It did, you know, it was something that they fixed itself. And overall, people who play other Bondi games know that it might take a little bit longer than what we like sometimes, but they do get around to banning stuff if it's too much of a format health issues so we're definitely early on i'm very curious to see where this goes but for me you know getting to see this deck play out when we were play testing it and, and watching other people play it man valkyrie mist should not have three cost reductions like that was the one that really stuck out to me is why yeah. is this a thing because that shuts off so much yeah she she just does too much. um She's practically a kill spell in these decks because the, the fact of the matter is against the white aggro deck, it's very unlikely that you're going to be able to deploy your whole hand anyway. And so like bouncing something back to someone's hand when they could have played any other blocker and all blockers basically just have the same text of reduce your damage taking this turn by one. Uh, she's practically a kill spell. And so that she's like a one mana, does exactly the same amount of damage total as Supernova Dragon Siege Worm. And um, just... Yeah, it is truly a remarkable card that that it, that it got printed, especially alongside all of these ways to just like easily play it on turn two, and beyond that, um, every other turn after the, that, and so it's it's just remarkable. Yeah, the card uh, the card does a lot, as you'd imagine, especially in this kind of strategy too. Because spoiler, we have all these free cards, and only costing one for Valkyrie is uh, is nuts <laughs> to say yeah, the least. Real. 
Yeah, I mean, even if, even if she only had two reduction symbols, she'd feel a little bit more fair because then at least you couldn't play her like on that crackback, like 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 going into your turn two, where you often go like you know like Mechwing Duck Satellite Satellite Dude, like. Even her just costing two would dramatically reduce the amount of damage you could put out alongside her. So with that, that is a term interview out of the way and all that stuff. And of course, I want to give you here a moment at the end. So any last minute uh, shout outs or kudos you want to give out while you have a have a couple minutes here at the end? Yeah, absolutely. There's uh, I'm just my whole team. Uh, Kyron introduced this deck to us. So uh, definitely shout out to him. He it's really uh, his uh, his bringing to us that got me into the top. Um, Ryan Miles, consistent testing partner. You, consistent testing partner. I appreciate your help in me getting there. Um, And yeah, just everyone that I was on a team with. Yeah, it was mostly just the on hand judge, it felt like, because we got synced up later on in the uh, testing. That was extremely (laughs) useful. I I would not have uh, traded that for anything. Perfect. Well, thank you again for your t- time. Congrats on top 32 finish. I definitely think we're going to be seeing a lot more of this deck in the near future. And, you know, hey, it's always good to have a budget option, but it might be a little too strong uh, <laughs> that we find <laughs> out. But we'll see where that goes. So for everyone else, thank you so much for watching. Take care of yourselves. Stay hydrated. Stay safe. And we'll see you in the next Battle Spirits Saga video. Bye.